It is my distinct honor and great pleasure to welcome you all to the 34th annual summer meeting in my hometown, St. Louis, Missouri. Our organization was founded a mere 34 years ago with no more than a handful of physicians determined to do good and create a Pakistani physician network in North America. Their cause was noble and their goals were grand. That led to the formation of APNA. We have grown from them to be the representative body of over 17,000 Pakistani physician descent who are now the practice in North America. When we think of the journey APNA has taken, we are and we should be very proud. We are the largest democratic organization of Pakistani outside of Pakistan. I am proud to be able to serve as a, your president at this time. It is a truly that thought and looking out all your faces that gives me a pause to think back to my first involvement with Abna more than 18 years ago. And to where I have come now, I have served as treasurer, secretary, president-elect, and now president. Abna has grown by leaps and bounds and I'm proud to have served this organization. I would be remiss, however, if I did not acknowledge the great role APNA has played in my life. For those who do not know me personally, my story is similar to many of yours. My father was a simple farmer and he was uneducated. He made it in his mission in life to see that I get the highest education, put me through high school, and more importantly, to go to medical school. I wouldn't be standing here if it were not the efforts of my parents who worked very hard to ensure that I was able to go to medical school and consider myself very fortunate that my mother is here tonight to celebrate with me and celebrate and celebrate Apna. I only wish my father was here. I belong to Kaidazam Medical College. I was the fourth batch and I began my education there. As you know, the education that never ends. The knowledge and the friends my school and Pakistan gave me is a treasure for me to cherish for my rest of my life. And I'm sure the same applies to many of you. In fact, I'm very proud again to say that Kaidi Azam has grown to be the point where we are, Alumni Medical Association of APNA as the component society. Importantly, however, as proud as we are of where we came from and where we attended medical colleges, we are part of a larger world now. And as you know, from, if you are from Dao, K, Sindh, Fatma Jinnah, Ras, Harvard, or Vashu, you are going to be my brothers and my sisters. I am proud that we have been able to overcome the barriers. They may be regional, religion, medical school, background. I am proud to say that we have active Hindu and Christian members within APNA. Why? Excuse me. Why we are very unique and different, we must always strive to be bigger than ourselves. APNA is a welcoming organization meant to encompass all of those Pakistani descent. I am proud of the strides we have made and hope we will continue to work together, representing the best of the founding ideals of both of our country of origin, Pakistan, and our homeland, the United States of America.
We must remain united, for we are always greater than the sum of our individual parts. To quote great American thinker, united we stand, divided we fall. That is why our motto this year was service with integrity and unity. As physicians, we have taken an oath to help others and to heal. Apna has brought us together to uphold that oath on a much larger scale. In the past six months, Apna has taken its service commitment very seriously. And we have come together to uphold one of the fundamental tenets of Apna to participate in medical relief and other charitable activities, both in Pakistan and North America. We have been on the ground helping in Pakistan in the aftermath of devastating floods. This year, Apna adopted the flood affected village of Munirabad. In a few weeks, we will be starting in village in Sindh, interior part of the Sindh. We donated to Japan in the wake of earthquake and tsunami. We were there when tornado ravaged the southern state of Alabama and others. And I would like to acknowledge Dr. Khalid Mutin, who helped to lead local relief efforts. And most recently, we included myself and others from St. Louis were able to drive to Joplin, which was affected with a devastating tornado. We were able to serve our own as Pakistani doctors were affected in their disaster. But more importantly, we were there to help the community at large, our community of American fellows. I must thank Dr. Naveed Zaidi for his service to the Joplin community, even after he lost his home, office, and many of his belongings in the tornado. Apna launched a hepatitis C initiative to curb the terrifying hepatitis epidemic, a project spearheaded by Dr. Makbul Arshad. We are sharing our resources, our knowledge, and our expertise, and to help save countless lives through the program. Apna received a wake-up call when we realized that there is no complete bone marrow registry for Southeast Asian. We answered this call by not only organizing a national bone registry, but also creating a bone marrow registry for Pakistan and Southeast Asians. These serve as a proof that we are united in our resolve and we will serve all human beings. Apna will remain committed to working for disaster relief wherever it strikes in the world. For we are all human beings and there, but for the grace of God, go I. It is integrity, this unity, and the service to commitment that truly makes Apna great. Mr. President, I thank you for inviting me here. I appreciate the opportunity to stand in front of so many people and talk about the importance of the relationship between the United States and Pakistan. May I also say before I start what an honor it is to be here also with Senator Casey, who does so much to support this relationship and has been so kind to me in my early months as a special representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan. If you could join me in welcoming him as well. I will say that for me, to stand here in front of all of you, I show some respect, if I can, for the greatness of this organization. Your president talked a little bit about all the things that you do, but your dedication to the United States, your dedication to Pakistan, and very importantly to me, the relationship between Pakistan and the United States makes this a very special occasion for me to have a chance to visit with you. The list of things that this organization does the support for medical education and research, fostering scientific development, improve the quality of medicine, deliver better, better health care, as the President said, respond to emergencies, not just in Pakistan, but in the United States of America. 
the assistance that you give to Pakistani physicians as they arrive in the United States to let them adjust to the new life here, the donations of medicine, of literature, of expertise, of time to your colleagues in Pakistan, all of these things are a crucial part of the people-to-people -people connection between Pakistan and the United States, and I believe form the core of what I'd like to spend a few minutes speaking to you about this evening, the importance of preserving, and I'd say, if possible, advancing the United States-Pakistan relationship. If I could, though, before I go to my text, just say that for me to stand here in front of all of you as the grandson of immigrants and all the children in the room just reminds me of the strength of the United States of America. That diversity is a strength. What we bring to the United States is a strength. And it's one of the reasons that America is such a great country. And so I salute you. And I salute all the things that you have done for yourself. As our friend had the good, the not, it was nice enough to say, I had the good fortune to serve in Pakistan as my very first post as a foreign service officer in the late 1970s. I traveled around the country. I experienced the hospitality, the history, and the culture of Pakistan. And you all will understand that in my business, I don't know how it is for doctors, but in my business, the profession of diplomacy, we say that that first post, for me, Pakistan, never leaves your heart. And so if you fast forward, if you fast forward 30 years, when earlier this year, President Obama and Secretary Clinton asked me to return to the State Department from retirement to serve as the Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan following the death of our very dear friend, Richard Holbrook. My answer could only be, yes, I will. Yes, I will try this. Yes, I will return to an area where my heart belongs to Pakistan and Afghanistan. I would say that many of you may have noticed that one of my recent visits to Pakistan coincided with the US action against Osama bin Laden. And I think it's worth saying here and saying out loud that as both the President and the Secretary of State have said, our counterterrorism cooperation with Pakistan helped lead us to Bin Laden. And many of you who saw President, Clinton, uh, President Obama say on 60 Minutes that more terrorists have been captured and killed in Pakistan than any other country in the world means this relationship is extremely important and there's more to do. My message to Pakistanis on that day and in the days I have been in Pakistan since is that with this success, with the success against bin Laden, brings a time of choice. And for both Pakistan and the United States, we have the capacity, we have it in our grasp to be finished with Al-Qaeda. But it requires choices, choices from Pakistan and choices from the United States. The Secretary Clinton said when she was in Islamabad in May, Pakistan and the United States should, she said, proceed in a spirit of openness and candor because part of friendship is speaking honestly and telling each other about our perspectives and when necessary, even difficult truths as we see them. Those of you who follow this news know that after the action against bin Laden, a series of senior Americans, Senator Kerry, Admiral Mullen, Secretary Clinton, CIA Director Bennett, all visited Pakistan. And we've just completed this series of visits. And this gets me back to the work that I have to do, which is to try to convince people that between Pakistan and the United States, this is the time to act and to act jointly. And not just on questions of terrorism, but on questions of Afghanistan, on questions of the economy, on questions of the region, that jointly Pakistan and America should try to go forward. And so in this role as the Secretary of Special Representative, that's my aim. My aim is to work jointly with Pakistan on our shared objectives and to foster the open, frank relationship that I believe both sides need. If I could just spend a moment or two talking about Pakistan, and I realize that as a foreigner, perhaps this only goes so far. But if you sit where I sit, and you look at what I look, it seems to me that Pakistan faces two great threats. Terrorism and extremism targeted at Pakistan and Pakistanis, and the critical challenge of growing Pakistan's economy. 
We don't need to go here tonight, I think, into the litany of deadly attacks on Pakistan's elected leaders, security forces, innocent civilians, all which highlight the continuing, continuing threat of violence and intolerance. I can tell you that I never make a talk in Pakistan. I am never on television in Pakistan with first, without respecting, without giving my respect and without recognizing that since 2003, terrorists have killed 19,000 Pakistani civilians in this reign of terror unleashed by the Pakistani Taliban and sympathizers. 2,500 Pakistani security personnel have died defending the Pakistani people. And so that for me, the message is a clear one, that terrorism in all its forms needs to be defeated, and the United States and Pakistan can do so jointly. Pakistan's economic challenges are also great. For example, energy shortages are hampering economic growth, contributing to political and social instability. But here again, my conviction from having served in Pakistan, is, in Pakistan and knowing Pakistanis is, it doesn't have to be that way. Because Pakistan's people and economy have shown tremendous resilience in the face of historic flooding and uncertainty. Pakistan's population growth offers a strong domestic market. And I believe that the rise of Pakistan's middle class, now 35 million people long, 35 million people strong, is an entrepreneurial edge that should provide focus for economic development, for pluralism, and for good government. And so these are the ways that we want to work jointly with Pakistan. Let's shift for a moment and give you a perspective on the other part of my job, which is in supporting our political and diplomatic effort to help bring about a resolution to the conflict in Afghanistan, a resolution to 30 years of war in Afghanistan. You all know that on June 22nd, President Obama announced that the United States would withdraw 10,000 troops from Afghanistan by the end of the year, and 23,000 surge troops will leave Afghanistan by the summer of 2012. The President also reaffirmed our long-term commitment to the region and a strategy based on three mutually reinforcing efforts. A military effort that has to continue and will continue with the 68,000 forces that will be there from 2012-2014 to keep the pressure on Al-Qaeda terrorists, the Taliban insurgents. A very large civilian effort which has supported Afghans as they undercut the pull of the insurgency and the job that we have been given now, which is to see if we can't find a political resolution to this conflict and end this war for Afghans. I would say that few countries have a stronger interest in the outcome of the conflict in Afghanistan than Pakistan. And few countries will be more central to ensuring success of any political settlement. That was the message that Secretary Clinton gave at her speech at the Asia Society on February the 18th. It's a message you can see in Prime Minister Ghilani's trip to Kabul in April, President Karzai's visit to Islamabad in May, and the work that the United States is doing with Afghanistan and Pakistan in something we're calling the core group to focus on the future of Afghanistan and how we can promote reconciliation there. And in fact, I came back to the United States on Wednesday morning from a meeting of the core group in Kabul, which I'd say was very successful. Military, intelligence, diplomatic people from all of our countries working together to see if we can't bring about reconciliation in an Afghan-led process. Our talks have been productive and we'll meet again in a month in Islamabad. Talk about in a minute, if I could, about the long-term relationship between the United States and Pakistan. One thing I think that's most important here is the economic assistance, the economic effort the United States is making to support the people of Pakistan. And very importantly, as some of us discussed before dinner, the Kerry Lugar Berman assistance program passed by the Senate and the House where the United States has provided $2 billion since October 2009 to address Pakistan's urgent energy <coughs> excuse me, and economic needs. Critical infrastructure, economic competitiveness, decreased risks for investors. For example, the Kerry Lugar Berman assistance is being used to complete two important dams, Sathara and Gomal Zam, that'll provide more power to Pakistan's, Pakistan's grid and also 
help Pakistan in the coming monsoon season. Other areas of Kerry Lugar Berman also are extremely important. And we've tried to refine our focus to five sectors energy, economic growth, stabilization of the federally administrated tribal areas in Khyber Pakhtunwa, education, and health. And our objective is simple. We want to demonstrate our commitment to the people of Pakistan over the long term. I'd like to take a moment just to single out one program, if I could, because it's so important to me and to Senator Casey. One of the most important effects of our recent cooperation is that after months of working together to address the threat posed by improvised explosive devices, or IEDs, which kill Pakistanis and kill Afghans and kill Americans, the Pakistani Ministry of the Interior approved a new national counter IED strategy on June 18th. It creates a framework to strengthen Pakistan's internal controls on precursors, improve interdiction efforts, and raise public awareness. And on the 5th of July, this week, we are sending a team to Islamabad to meet with the Pakistani government to make good on this commitment to finally deal once and for all with this problem of improvised explosive devices. And I'd like to recognize again Senator Casey for his steadfast support on this issue. One other very important point going forward, and that is that I don't see how these problems in Pakistan and Afghanistan, and indeed the region, will ever be solved unless there is economic development. And not economic development necessarily promoted by official governmental economic assistance, but until entrepreneurs and foreign direct investment and people who invest in jobs and entrepreneurship are successful. And that's one of the reasons that we've been working so hard to accomplish a task to see if we can't find a way to have one economic space from Central Asia to, to, uh, to New Delhi or even to, to Bangladesh, maybe a new Grand Trunk Road where people will be able to share the wisdom and the entrepreneurship and the success of this great economic space. And there was a major step forward in this area on June the 12th with the implementation of the historic transit trade agreement between Afghanistan and Pakistan and further progress between Pakistan and India so that there will be the capacity one day to move goods all across this region and create jobs for people to come in. One other point that we've talked about a little bit here before dinner and I want to emphasize, and that is the role that you all can play in one of the most important efforts between the United States and Pakistan, and that is promoting the people-to-people -people ties between the American and the Pakistani people. We've expanded our academic and professional exchanges. The Fulbright program in Pakistan is the largest in the world. Repeat that. The Fulbright program in Pakistan is the largest. 200 scholarships for advanced degrees planned for 2001, and in total, 5,000 Americans and Pakistanis will participate in U.S. academic exchanges and English language programs this year. And I believe that APNA and other members of the Pakistani American community can serve as a force multiplier to bridge the gap between where we find ourselves today and where we could go. Because if our philosophy is it doesn't have to be that way, then it is incumbent upon us to do what we can to find ways to work jointly to pursue Pakistani and American interests. And so the vital support that you are already providing for health, education, professional development, humanitarian assistance, these create the most important permanent links between Pakistan and the United States. And we'll work together on other issues in the future. Reconstruction opportunity zones, enterprise funds for Pakistan, kind of economic development we will all look forward to participating in. We remain committed to building a broad partnership with Pakistan focused not only on acting jointly against our mutual threats, but also on helping the Pakistani people overcome the economic, social, and political challenge that stand in the way of a better future for them. So I want, again, to offer my sincere thanks to you for your contributions, for what you've done in the past, what you do today, what you will do in the future, and to offer my encouragement to find new ways to build connections between our nations. 
You will find our office open to you and to your ideas, and I hope that you will, you will follow through with some of them and we can work together. Because you manifest the very best ideas and intentions for the relationship between the United States and Pakistan. So I thank you again for inviting me, and I thank you very much for your service to this wonderful relationship. Doctor, thank you for that introduction. Uh, Dr. Tariq, and the, as president, the officers of APNA, and so many others who made uh, my visit possible. I'm grateful, grateful for this opportunity. We have a lot of priorities as Americans, don't we? We have the priority of making sure that we can create an economy and build the jobs of the future and help people through this difficult economic period. We're concerned about our deficit and our debt. We're working on that in Washington. I won't go through that tonight, but suffice it to say we have a lot of work to do. We, we hold our children as, as a priority. Our children that need education, the early learning, and health care, and so many other things that we want to do to uh, invest in the future. We're concerned about our workforce. Our workforce is a priority. And of course, we're concerned about our own national security. For so many reasons, one of the, the basic concerns that we have about our relationship with, with Pakistan has to do with our own security in the United States of America. So we remember tonight that that relationship is about our own security as well as the security of the region in South Asia. And we also remember at the same time that this relationship can't simply be a relationship between one government and another. That's not enough. This has to be and will always be if we work hard to get it right. This will be a relationship between the American people and the people of Pakistan. We have to remember that tonight. Because we do have common interests, and the only way to make sure that we remember that is to demonstrate day in and day out our mutual respect for one another as Americans and as, as uh, Americans who care about the relationship between the United States and Pakistan. So we need to work on an honest dialogue. And we know that times have been very difficult in this relationship. We know that now more than ever, we need an honest dialogue. We need to be honest about our differences. We also need to be honest about where we can move our relationship forward. Ambassador Grossman spoke about the enhanced partnership with Pakistan, that legislation, which is so important to this important relationship that we have with the people of Pakistan. We know that we have, as I said before, common interests, but also, I, I believe, uh, shared values as well. And we also should acknowledge, as the ambassador did, the sacrifice made by the American people, but the sacrifices at the same time made by the people of Pakistan, whether they're civilians, whether they're uh, security forces, or otherwise. We remember those sacrifices tonight. And finally, let me say, as, as the ambassador said tonight, and as so many of our friends have talked about, especially in the last couple of months, we want to make sure that here in America, we're doing everything possible to limit limit the, the possibility that the shipment of ammonium nitrate from Pakistan into Afghanistan, we want to limit the possibility, limit the instances in which that can happen so that we're protecting our American troops as well as protecting the people of Pakistan. So when I ask members of this audience to do all you can to contact your friends, your relatives in Pakistan and tell them to pass legislation that will reduce the chance that a Pakistani citizen will be blown up or, or gravely injured uh, by a roadside bomb. When you contact 
those that you know to do everything you can to make sure that American fighting men and women will not be the victim of a roadside bomb. We know that you do that because you care about America, you, you care about the United States and our troops, and you also care about the people of Pakistan. So tonight, as we... Tonight, as we celebrate and as we share a meal and come together tonight, I want to thank you again for all that you do, day in and day out, to bring healing and hope to the world and healing and hope to the United States of America. And let us tonight recommit ourselves to that those patriot dreams that we hold in our hearts as Americans. And let us do that together as one people, as Americans, and hold in your hearts the, the, the spark and the flame that you brought from your native land. Let us do that together and make us a stronger country and strengthen the relationship between the United States and Pakistan. God bless you.